pi. There are different approaches such as the method of bisection that we can use to obtain the root of a function. One very important and effective one is called the newton raphson iterative method. Let's have a look at it. Before we can look at the newton raphson method, we need to know some basic facts. First of all, what do we mean by the roots of a function? It means what values of x make the value of y zero. And if you look at that graph of our function, what it actually means is the x-intercepts, the points at which the function, the graph, intersects the x-axis. So for this example, there's one zero, one root, at point A with coordinates zero, zero. The second root is point B, coordinates two, zero, point C at four, zero, and point D at five, zero. As was mentioned, the newton raphson method is a very well-known numerical method to find the roots of an equation. Let's develop the iterative process. We have our function, f of x, and labelled is the zero the root on the x-axis. We start by estimating a point close to the root, which we will call x0. What we do then is obtain the equation for the tangent AB at point B, which is the Y value of point X0. When we do that, the X intercept of the tangent line AB provides our second estimate for the root, which is labeled X1. In general, if a line passes through the point AB, then the equation is given by y minus b equals m bracket x minus a, as you can see there in the rectangle. We're going to use that equation in a moment. Now, a, b, of course, is the tangent to our function, f of x, and the formula for the equation of a straight line. So the coordinates of a are x1, 0, and the coordinates of point b are x0, f of x0. So applying the formula for the straight line, we have f of x0 minus 0 equals m x0 minus x1. And that simplifies. The gradient of the tangent, of course, means the derivative of the function at that point. So we can replace m by f dashed x0, which means the derivative of the function at x0. 0, of course, we can leave out. And now we can rearrange that to obtain x1 by itself. That means transpose the equation. And we have an expression for our estimate for x1. So that would be a point closer to the root that we want. What we do now is to use point x1 as our starting value and repeat the process. And in the diagram, you can see exactly what's going on. So if we follow the same method, as previously, the equation of the straight line will be f of x1 minus 0 equals m bracket x1 minus x2. And then we can replace m by the derivative of the function at point x1. There we are. And transposing that to obtain x2, we have, as you can see there, an expression for that value. Now, of course, we can continue that to obtain estimates for x3, x4, and so on. But let's generalize that expression. There we go. The nth estimate, where n is a positive whole number, is given by what you can see there. Let's apply that to an example. We have our function, a quadratic, a parabola shape, given by x squared minus 3x. And one of the zeros, the roots, is at x equals 3, which is marked there. And we will use as our start value, our first estimate, to be x equals 4. So our function is x squared minus 3x. The derivative of f of x, if we differentiate f of x, gives us 2x minus 3. We need that. And our start value, x naught, is 4. Substitute that information into our general expression for the nth estimate, and that's what it looks like. And for our first estimate, 
x1, we can replace n with 0, and that will give us x1, of course, and that's what it looks like. Now we substitute the value that we know for x0, which is x, x0 equals 4. And going through the process of computation, we end up with x1 equals 3.2. So our first estimate was 4, and our next estimate is 3.2. Remember, the exact value is 3. Okay, let's obtain an estimate for x2 by using x1 as our starting point. Again, substituting n equals 1 in the general expression. And then x1 is 3.2, and that gives us an estimate of approximately 3.01, which is quite close to our exact value, isn't it? Now, if we do one more, x3, we get approximately a value of 3.00. So, even after three iterations, or actually it's two iterations, isn't it? Because x0 equals 4 was our initial guess. After only two iterations, we have come pretty much spot on to our exact value. So the newton raphson method seems to be quite effective. It converges quite quickly to our desired value. Now let's find the other root, which is x equals 0. We can use a start value of negative 1. So our first estimate, x1, will be negative 0.2. Our second value, x2, comes out to be approximately negative 0.11. And our third value, our third iteration, is quite accurate, approximately 0. So again, after just two iterations, the method has zeroed in on the 0, if you pardon the pun. Here is a graphical representation of the method. We have our quadratic equation. The first root is 3, and it shows the tangent line at x equals 4. That was our start value. And the first iteration comes out at 3.2. The second iteration, that's represented by the green circle, is 3.01 approximately. And the third iteration, as you can see there, very close to 3. And if we keep going, The 15th iteration, I mean, we could go on forever with this, but you can see that even after four iterations, we're pretty well spot on to what we want. Let's find our second value, which is at x equals 0, and our start value is negative 1. There it is, the tangent line at x equals negative 1, and our first estimate iteration is negative 0.2. Our second iteration, negative 0.2. 1, 1 approximately. Third iteration, very close to 0. If we keep going. By the time we get to the 15th iteration, it's pretty well exactly equal to 0. The newton raphson method is certainly a very good method to use and converges readily to the given root, but there are a couple of limitations. The first one is that turning points should never be used as starting values. And why is that? Turning points are stationary points where the gradient is zero. In our formula, in the denominator, where we have f dash x of n, we want the value of the derivative at the turning point. Well, that's going to be zero, isn't it? So in effect, we are trying to divide by zero, which is undefined, can't do. So never use turning points as starting values. Other points that you can't use as starting values are points of inflection. Points of inflection are points on the graph where the gradient changes sign. That means the shape of the graph changes from being concave to convex or from convex to concave. And why does that give us problems, you might ask? It's because the gradient or the tangent line oscillates it never goes to where we want it to it does not converge to the root and you can see that when you draw the graph of what's happening so here's a graph we have two turning points on that and one point of inflection so that means those three points would not be used as starting values 
Here's a demonstration of what happens when we have a start value at a point of inflection. For this graph, the point of inflection is at x equals 2. There's our first tangent, and our first estimate is that the root is 4. Second estimate, second iteration, 3.2. Notice what's happening. The estimates are fluctuating all over the place. Not a good sign. So the message remains. Do not choose turning points and points of inflection as start values. I hope you found this short introduction to the newton raphson method interesting and informative. You can investigate it further, particularly look at what happens if you choose a point as a starting value that is exactly halfway between two of the roots, two of the zeros. Until next time, bye-bye.